Good evening. This is the Thursday, January 11, 2018 regular meeting of the Morro Bay Harbor Advisory Board. We're meeting in the Veterans Memorial Building and uh, we do have a quorum, so we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, all of the board members are present this evening and uh, we'll have a moment of silence, please. Thank you, and Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we have Chair and Advisory Board, our liaison is not here this evening, uh, Mr. Makowetsky. So we have um, Advisory Board and Chair announcements and presentations. Gene? Um, looks like some anchovies are back in the bay. And this is December or January, and it's kind of unusual to see anchovies in the bay. But they're all about, oh, four to six inches long, and there's, there's schools of anchovy in the bay. And the water looks pretty clear, even after the rain. Good. Yeah, so anchovies. Jeremiah? Uh, you know, it's really not an announcement, I guess, but you know, I frequently uh, asked about some of the bluefin that's been coming in tomorrow bay here in the last few weeks and some of the swordfish. And a lot of people don't know that we uh, have been experiencing a lot of bluefin and swordfish out, out in front of Morro Bay and uh, the swordfish boats have been bringing them in here. We're also usually the first or up to the third highest landings here in Morro Bay of swordfish on the west coast. So uh, we're usually somewhere between the first and third depending on where the fish are, how the weather is generally up here. But in any case, I just thought I'd bring that up in our local uh, fish markets have the live, uh, have the uh, fresh uh, swordfish, very, very nice fish, and uh, bluefin tuna. Third highest landing on the west coast of continental the United States? Yeah, uh, of the United States, yes. Holy yes. cow. Yes. And Anywhere between first and And this year, about how far out are they? We, well, we won't know until the season won't be over until the uh, end of February here, so first of February. Uh, right now, they, by law, they have to be 25 miles. But when they start, they're 8 miles, and uh, then they move at the 15th of November, move out to 25 because of the whale migration. But anyway, this also, uh, I just wanted to make it. Can I put this in front of the screen here? So anyways, this is uh, the sixth edition of our uh, economic report. Uh, we've done them since 2011, and this is the sixth one that we've had coming out. It just came out. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, for the Morro Bay commercial fishing in, uh, in this port. This does not include Port St. Louis. We'll be coming out with their own very briefly, very shortly. Uh, these, so uh, if anybody is interested in these, they're twelve. We pay twelve dollars a piece. We'd like to give them away to everybody, and it's it briefly runs down all. It's thirty-three pages, very short, with pictures, and it runs down all of the fisheries in Morro Bay itself, the value and the landings in pounds, uh, and also historic. Uh, landings and so forth. If anybody was interested, I would be happy to supply them one. Unfortunately, it would be $12. I just thought I'd look that. Uh, 
And this just in, uh, uh, <laughs> the Central Coast Women for Fisheries fundraiser, Albacore Enchiladas, uh, will be held Saturday, February 3rd. So that's uh, four enchiladas in a tray. The trays are $10 a piece. There's the green or the red, and they're both very good, as many of us know. Uh, they're West Coast troll caught albacore from the fishing vessel Capriccio, Wayne Moody and his lovely wife Diane. And uh, so that's Saturday, February 3rd, 2018. So call, uh, there's numbers to call here, but I go, go Jackie at uh, area code 805-772-8281 or Lenore 805-550-0253. And that's all I've got to. Thank you. Lynn, you have not, okay. Neil? Dana? Yeah, I'll give a little progress report on the Maritime Museum. Uh, you, many of you have probably seen the building is up and uh, outside of it is all sided. You know, windows are in. The roof is going on tomorrow. Uh, it's sheetrocked on the inside. It's all wired. And so it's coming together pretty good. And I uh, just wanted to give you that update. Thank you. Bill? Yes, um, on the screen in here, uh, the uh, Friends of the Morro Bay Harbor Department's next fundraising project is to try to raise money to rebuild the floating dock that the sea lions uh, occupy. It um, is in terrible shape, and as everyone knows here in the harbor, that seems to be a popular spot for them, and it's worked out very well. We want to make sure we maintain that but we need some money to rebuild it. So you can go to the Friends of the Morro Bay Harbor Department website, um, which is on the screen here, and donate money. You can call Becca, who is uh, the supervisor at the Harbor Department that is um, running this project. Jeremiah, the um, Harbor Patrol officer, is in charge of it. If you have any questions or any concerns, or you could help us with any donations, would be very appreciative. Eric, do you have anything to say on this? No, just it, you know, it used to be a, a piece of infrastructure for transient boaters, but sea lions seem to have taken it over in lieu of taking over spaces on shore, so we want to maintain it and make sure that it's safe and, and usable. I mean, we'll still use it in a storm if need be, um, but haven't had to, but it's, it's a great place for the location for the sea lions. Kayakers love, love it. The tour boats love it, so it's a win-win to leave it over there, but it's time to rebuild it. It's it's about 30 years old, and we're looking for donations because I don't currently have it funded. And it's not cheap to replace that stuff. I'm not going to build it to boat spec. We're going to build it to seal spec, whatever that is. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Um, I have a little presentation. Gene, would you join me, please? <laughs> so Gene Dougherty, who's been on the Harbor Advisory Board for some time now and was recently uh, reappointed by the council, as was Lynn Mize reappointed by the council yesterday uh, for another four-year term. Um, Gene uh, not only has served the city and the community and the Harbor Advisory Board, but also is the pretty much the caretaker for all of the moorings in town. He's an architect that works on the waterfront, so Gene does a variety of things. But as it relates to Harbor Advisory Board, uh, the city recognized uh, Gene fairly recently with a nice plaque that uh, Mr. Andrusby uh, put together, and we have our own recognition for you. Recognition of 30 years of service. Oh, that's beautiful. There you go. I'm worrying. I'm worrying. When, when I think of when we thought of Gene, we just couldn't get past moorings. 
And there you go. So, so, so thank you for thank your you service. Thank you for your service, and we look forward to your oh, that, that more. more for you. Okay, um, and uh, our liaison, Councilman Makowetsky is with us. It uh, wasn't when we first started, but thank you for coming. And do you have anything in terms of announcements or presentations, Matt? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that brings us to public comment period. And this is public comment for anything that is not on the agenda uh, this evening or for anything on the agenda for whom the party cannot stay. So if you have public comment, please come up to the podium and give us your name and your residence and have at it. Well, good evening, Chair, Board Members. Larry Newland with the Moore Bay Maritime Museum Project, and Dana's already given a little bit of an update on that. Uh, we're moving along pretty well. Uh, with that, uh, people are always asking, when are you going to be open? And it looks like, at best case scenario, that'll be Harbor Festival 2018. One of the impediments to opening is getting electricity there. So that's kind of where I'm going with this conversation. And it's pretty expensive, eight to ten thousand dollars to put a, a transformer on that pole and 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 uh, trench over to our to our box, 200 amp service. And it dawned on me, and I mentioned this to Eric, and I mentioned it to uh, to Dana, that for that lot to become useful, even for something as routine as boat storage on a trailer, those overhead lines are going to have to go away sooner or sometime. So um, not sure exactly how much that would cost. The estimate that I got walking around, kind of knee-jerk estimate with a PG&E fellow about a week ago, was thirty to $50,000 to bury those, put another pole on the east side and then uh, come over, probably a surface-mounted transformer towards the Embarcadero. And so by uh, what I was thinking is maybe it would be better for us to wait a month or two. Right now they're talking April, May, or June to make us whole. We're, we would consider kicking out that date out a few months. If this body and the city wanted to proceed further, we would throw our money in with the cities to pool it, to pool our resources, and maybe do it sort of comprehensively all at once. You might be wondering, well, what's in it for us? What's in it for us is we want to expand someday. And those, that pole and those wires are an impediment. You can't get more than, uh, you can't get uh, closer than 12 feet. So a radius of 12 feet around those 12 kV lines. That's what the Green Book from PG&E says. And they're sort of the boss in this. So um, to have parking lot lights, to have uh, electricity for a boat yard or even lights for a boat storage or anything or for a museum expansion, something has to be done. So I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. If somebody wants to talk to us, please do so pretty quickly because we've already put a $2,000 deposit down. Uh, with PG&E, that basically that 2000 is an engineering design, which basically consists of putting a can up there, running conduit down the pole, entrenching about 70 feet to our box. That design cost us 2,000 bucks, so the can cost 5,000. So you can see, you know, it gets pretty expensive. So we can run our building on a little generator for a while, but we can't get signed off for occupancy for public purposes until the power is hooked up. So we don't want to delay that too long because we'd like to be running late summer or even Harbor Festival. But I'm just throwing it out there, food for thought. If you guys want to talk about this, we're open to it. So that's all I had to say, really. And I'm here for any questions or if anybody wants to Before discuss. you sit down, Bill, got anything for Larry? Okay, Dana? So to clarify, if you do this on your own, then how would that work for down the road trying to put that underground? 
Well, somebody could come back and do that, but they would be responsible for making us whole again per PG&E. I asked that question. So in other words, it seems inefficient for us to spend this money and then 18 to 36 months later or whatever, the city comes along and it's like, oh, geez, now we've got to disconnect you and hook you back up. If we had known this, we wouldn't have done this. And I said, well, maybe I should bring it up with them. So, yeah, it's, it's imp the impetus is on whoever disconnects somebody's power to make them whole again. And we're moving forward. So, but we're willing to delay a little bit if there's an economy of scale here. And I don't know that there is, but if there is, food for thought. Neil? No, just thank you for the information. Lynn? No. Jeremiah? Yeah, Larry, I don't know. So, you know that we're big supporters of the the museum, of course, but I, what is the usual thing when this is done? Does, when they're developing an area, because that area is in development. Yeah. Uh, is it normal for the developer to run all the power? How do they, or would the lease or, in this case, the museum generally be the one who ran the power? Well, the party so, that had probably this meeting that has the most experience with that would be the harbor director. Do you have an opinion? So, so do you see what I'm saying? So. Wouldn't the owner of the property property generally run the power to the property? Uh, I'm going to throw it back to Dana, who does construction sites all the time. And yeah, uh, as the contractor on the job and having dealt with this, um, basically they're already planning. And like what Larry was just saying, they spent two thousand. They're going to spend more, but so it's it's part of the project. So yes. The power is right there. We're going to run it from that pole. That's the closest place to the building. Jeremiah's question was: Is there a normal, if you will? Who is there do, generally do, the do, do, do all such do all yes. development projects? Does it yes. fall to the developer? Pretty much, yeah. To, the to owner that? and the developer, yeah. That, that who that's who takes care of. Not that. the owner of the property. Well. Yes, or the leasee, or however that's arranged. You know, if you're so it would not be unusual the then if the the city, because I can see where the city in the future at some point is going to need to bring power into the rest of that area. And, and Larry can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure a license agreement says you're responsible for utilities. Yeah, we're we're not making. Up. We make no. Uh, I mean, we know we're on the hook to bring power to our building. Yeah, All they I'm plan saying on is, doing it. They're just looking at rather than. Say down the road, we want to go ahead and put those lines underground to facilitate and facilitate power for boat storage or boat yard or anything over there. And those lines have to go underground. We would also have to pay to redo his lines That's because right. he is right. But so, anyways, um, I guess what if my thought was it would have behooved the city to do it sooner than later. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, and, and see, right okay, now, okay, if they let, did okay, it. Okay, let's, let's move this along, okay, okay. If, if that's okay. Uh, Gene? Okay. Larry, I have a suggestion, and that is that uh, the museum uh, provide the chairman of the Marine Services Facility Ad Hoc Committee uh, with a letter stating what the opportunities are and what your position is and what, if anything, the museum is in a position to contribute financially to that process. And then uh, we would happy, happily put it on the okay. agenda um, for three weeks from now. That's okay. when the next meeting is, is three weeks from now. And uh, if, it, if the board uh, determines that that's something that it wants to do, then it would issue a formal recommendation to the council to take some kind of action. Sounds what happens good. after that, we have zero control okay. over. But, I can do that. But that's my suggestion. I will do that. At least that gets it. You'll have a vehicle to get it up up the hill. That makes sense. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So that brings us to consent calendar. Um, approval of minutes from the last meeting, which was November, last regular meeting, which is November 16th. Uh, do we have any comments or corrections 
uh, from the board to the meeting, the meeting minutes from November 16, 2017. <coughs> Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Okay, moved by Bill. Is there a second? I'll second, second that. Okay, seconded by Gene. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Carries. So that's uh, the next item is uh, B1, which is the Harbor Department status report. Mr. Andersby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And welcome back. Happy New Year, everybody. That was a special meeting. So recent Harbor Department activity um, to date, which is mostly December and maybe a little bit of January, but uh, 11 emergency responses, 111 calls for service, typical pattern, 32 assists, um, some enforcement contacts, four weather warnings, two hazardous bars. Hasn't been a lot of big surf, fortunately for the boating public. Um, lack of surf probably means lack of storms for the, for the people that want rain, so I guess they sort of go hand in hand. It'd be nice to have a little more weather, but we'll see what happens. Um, December 2, we had a call for some fishermen on the south side of the rock, um, 50 feet up the side of the rock, kind of stuck and ended up escorting them down. They got reprimanded by state parks, as you know, you're not supposed to climb the rock. Um, December 10th, we assisted the Coast Guard with a boat uh, tow. December 13th, the luxury yacht Butterfly, which is, um, I guess, Larry Page's personal boat, founder of Google. It was here in town for a night, which he wasn't on it apparently, but his crew was. Um, going for a little surf trip from the Bay Area down to Santa Barbara, so that must have been nice. Um, and then December 24th, we had a drone that got stuck up on the rock and had to get retrieved with us in the fire department. That's becoming a more prevalent occurrence with people flying drones, trying to film surfing and whatnot as those things get mixed up and end up on the rock occasionally, so we've got to start watching out for that. Um, on the 30th, we assisted the PD with a landlord-tenant dispute on one of our lease sites. It got resolved as one of the boaters. And boater on dock that wasn't supposed to be there, apparently, and the, the landlord warned him off. And you know, on the 31st, we had a call for an SUP overturn near the sea line dock. Pretty standard stuff, relatively benign winter so far, so we'll see how it keeps on going. Uh, recent council activity on the 12th, the council approved two new leases for lease agreements on the waterfront. Um, one of them was at the boat yard. Uh, as you know, uh, earlier last or later last year, we approved a, a new lease for that site. As you know, that's the site of the sa failing seawall and revetment. And we, uh, city council, approved a new lease for that site to settle a potential pretty nasty lawsuit there. So we're moving forward, hopefully, on that. And then another master lease agreement. That same leaseholder is um, in escrow to buy the Otter Rock Cafe next door. And so. Um, We've got a tentative new lease agreement there that'll kick in when certain things take place during that purchase. So um, we'll be looking forward to that continuing, knock on wood, to move forward. Uh, that seawall going under repair probably next fall um, based on the, the permit process that they have to go through the timeline. They're probably not going to be ready for permits until next fall. So we'll hopefully see that seawall repaired and then Otter Rock Cafe will undergo a major renovation. Um, over next winter as well, and then the whole place will open back up for service, and we'll have a nice new um, refurbished site there and a good seawall. Uh, also on the 12th, the city council um, approved a conditional consent of landowner agreement to TLC Family Enterprises for the continued pursuance of redevelopment of the Otter Rock lease site, which is the next site to the south of the boatyard. Um, so TLC is moving forward on that and required to start submitting plans, so we'll see how that develops as that time goes on. And then on January, January 10th, which was just yesterday, as I think Ron alluded to earlier, the um, city had the advisory body interviews yesterday. Um, Gene was reappointed for a four-year term. Lynn was appointed for a four-year term. Um, had a couple other people that ran for Lynn's seat, only one that showed up at the meeting. Um, but the council um, chose Lynn and Gene, and congratulations. And We'll be doing the election probably first thing next meeting in um, February to see who's going to run this show. Yeah. On the fishing front, I'm not going to really add anything there. Um, I think Jeremiah had enough. Recreational rockfish season is closed for a few months, so the launch ramp is pretty quiet. Um, we'll see how that turns out and see what Dungeness Crab um, season goes. Launch ramp annual parking passes are good f um, on sale now, $110. Price hasn't gone up. We've kept them pretty much the same. 
Um, January 1st, we participated in the Cayucas Polar Bear Dip at the Cayucas Pier as a really a training exercise with CAL FIRE and Cayucas Fire and other ocean rescue agencies and provided water safety services. It was a beautiful day and surf was pretty darn small, so it was pretty uneventful. I think it was probably the lar largest cloud crowd they've seen in a long time. A lot of people swam out around the pier. I think the water's relatively benign for here. It's probably mid to high 50s, so it wasn't freezing and small surf made a lot of people want to swim. And then under, starting underway tomorrow and through the Martin Luther King weekend is Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival. So go to their website, morrobaybirdfestival.org, and lots of events all over not just Morro Bay area, but uh, really the county for different birding activities. On to the pending HAB recommendations matrix. Um, item number one, trying to keep these organized a little better, numbering them and keeping updates where they are and, and new red um, type when something new is on the list. Um, so we're, we're working with state parks to try and re-engage them to start talking about State Park Marine and Cafe. Um, we've had some folks retire in Sacramento and a new superintendent over the last year and a half, so we're just trying to reach out and get that ball rolling again because it's been stuck in the mud for quite a while. Um, <coughs> Number two, um, staff provide counsel with modified sections of municipal code for environmental BMPs. I really see that as part of our rules and regulations update. And Ron and Lynn and I met earlier today and talked about February agenda. And we're going to be having one of the rule and regulation items um, on February's agenda. So we'll be keeping moving that forward and hopefully get another one on for March. So we'll see those moving forward. Um, nothing to item number three. Um, item number four. Um, City Council approved issuance of a draft Marine Service Facility Boatyard request for qualifications document. Um, we issued that. Um, as you know, it didn't go anywhere. We're working on um, financial feasibility study and we'll be bringing to the February meeting some update to the Harbor Advisory Board on that. Um, working with the ad hoc committee and um, putting together a um, scope of work and getting that feasibility study out to see where that might go. Um, item number five. Um, City Council involved Harbor Advisory Board and Incorporation Measure D and the General Plan Local Coast Plan update. We've formed, as you know, a, a, a subcommittee of two subcommittees. Basically, we've got um, Gene and Ron, our ad hoc uh, work and waterfront ad hoc committee members, meeting with two committee members, subcommittee members of the Planning Commission, um, Joe and Graffia and um, Jerry Luer, and we just met again right before this meeting for our second meeting to go over Measure D and working waterfront items, um, try and get some clarification on Measure D ambiguities and working waterfront mission statement and policy. And I think we made some good progress today. Um, I'll be giving a little more, maybe myself or Ron or Gene can give a little more update um, in our working waterfront section, but that's moving forward nicely. Um, nothing on item six, nothing on item seven. Um, item eight, I'll report out during Eelgrass ad hoc committee time. Um, I've got working on a new agreement with the Anchor QA consultant. That should be finalized here fairly shortly, so we'll get them under contract and start them working forward. Um, nothing on number uh, nine, nothing oh, on item 10 that goes, bleeds onto the next page. Um, and that's the same as um, Measure D, working waterfront. Um, uses in the general plan, local coastal plan. Again, we met and we'll give a little better report on that a little further along. Um, and then item number 12, paid parking be established on around the Embarcadero. As you know, we heard this earlier last year, previously in, in 2017, and, and made some recommendations to the city council in terms of how they should handle paid parking. And it is going to be going to um, planning commission. Um, at some point here in the future with the HABS recommendations, I don't have a hard and fast date from the community development director, um, but they've rest assured that he rest, rest assured that um, the recommendations will be carried forward to Planning Commission and City Council when those two bodies take those items back up, but they tentatively don't have them on any hard and fast date at the moment. Any questions? Comments? Gene? Yeah, you mentioned the drone on the rock. Um, I was in Laguna Beach just recently, and they prohibit drones over public beaches and over public parks. So I just thought that was interesting. Who does that? Laguna Beach. Oh, well. 
-hmm. And state parks, I believe, has some probably restrictions on their properties as well, which becomes the rock when you get too close to it. So I suspect as time goes on and if more people begin using them and um, as they have incidents, they'll rise to the top and maybe some regulatory folks will start looking at them. But so far, it hasn't been any major issues that, other than you know things getting stuck like that, but we'll see. Jeremiah? Lynn? Neil? Dana? Yes. Um, the have recommendations number four, it says here also uh, uh, next week, the 23rd, you're going to lay out the scope of work to get authorization uh, at city council meetings. Is that what that's, that's what that says right there? That's a, a plug-in I put in there. Um, I'm, I don't know that I'm going to be able to keep to that. That was a tentative get to the city council. I've laid out a bunch of things for future city council meetings, and that's one of them that um, is a sort of a wish list for me. So, um, yeah, that's, thanks for pointing that out, but I don't know that I'll get to that point because okay. that's so I, a couple of weeks away. Right, and then after that, in February, then we'll be looking at something, some yeah. draft. Yeah, and that's, that wouldn't enable me to bring it, run it by the HAB either <clears throat> before February. Okay. Thank you. Bill? No. I have another thing I forgot. Sure. Yes. Uh, derelict boat disposal happened yesterday down at the launch ramp? Yes. How many boats? Four boats? Five? You do five, yeah. Five boats. And just do you happen to know what the grant amount is for five those five boats? About twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand. Pretty much expended the existing grants that we have now. Okay. I'm just thinking how much cheaper it would be if there were an actual haul out facility. And then also I was starting to think about the grants you've been working on uh, towards replacing all of you know the lawn tramp area and everything and I'm not gonna wanna tear that new ramp up once it gets done either by dragging fifty foot steel boats up. Yeah, those are the extreme the end, damage, and hopefully yeah. we're down we're down to the end of those. But you never know. But that's that's something I'm going to be thinking forward as we move into the engineering of that project, um, and seeing about the possibility of if there's not a huge cost difference of designing with that in mind. I mean, yeah, ultimately a boatyard is where those things would go. That would make total sense that you had a, a hardened concrete pad that you could go drag them onto and, and crush them. But short of that, I think we need to look at the launch ramp renovation project and put an eye towards making sure that it's armored enough to be able to withstand that. Because you're right, we don't want to just destroy it on the first week. Um. An alternative, and I don't mean this by way of suggesting that Morro Bay doesn't need a bowyard. An alternative, and it's very common all over everywhere, is to use bags, use roller bags, bring the boat out. Adds cost. It adds cost, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's roll them out like Egyptian style. Yeah, it's Pyramid very common. Moving style. It's very common. Uh, yeah. When some well, quick sea story. So one of the hurricanes, little Katrina, Katrina ended up putting a couple of crew boats three quarters of a mile inland. And uh, I was on for the insurance company for one of those boats, and uh, Titan uh, Diving and Salvage moved that boat three quarters of a mile inland to the beach on bags, and it took a day and a half. No pain, no strain. And a 50-footer doesn't need very big bags. And uh, any commercial diving outfit can do that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going there, okay? <laughs> I'm not going there. Okay, anything else um, for the director relative to his status report? I okay. do have, if, you, if I can so indulge you, uh, go back to the drone talk for a minute. Um, reminded me, if you may or may not know, but it's a good time to put a shout out to the public and to the HAB. The, the police department has two drones and they've been working over the last year 
to train officers to be, you know, the FAA certified pilots to be able to, to operate those and use them not just for enforcement purposes, but probably more for search and rescue type purposes. And um, I believe either the first or second meeting in February, they're bringing some policy towards to the city council for approval and probably going to do a little drone demo as well. So police department will be having those up and running, hopefully by this spring, summer. So from lifeguarding and public safety rescue, you know, boaters, getting called in rescues on the sand spit, I think they'll be a huge asset. They're going to set up a race course in here? Maybe. Race them? <laughs> Matt, we need to see them race. Okay, okay thank you. Um, before we move on to uh, business items, um, thanks to Dana pointed out to me that I incorrectly um, introduced A1, so the motion is incorrect. So we need to, uh, I need to reintroduce it and we need to have a new motion. I said that it was uh, that the meetings were for a regular Harbor Advisory Board meeting on November 16th. That's incorrect. It was a special Harbor Advisory Board meeting, and uh, so I needed a, here. I need a motion, please, to approve the meeting, approve the minutes from the special Harbor Advisory Board meeting on November 16th, 2017. So moved. And rescinding the previous action. I am receiving. We are. Do we need to vote on the rescind? No, I think rescinding? just put it in this same motion that you're rescinding ah. the previous and approving the new. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the motion is to rescind the previous motion and to uh, solicit the approval of the Harbor Advisory Board for the minutes from the special Harbor Advisory Board meeting held on November 16th. So moved. Thank you. Second? S second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. Thank you. Dana, thank you. So that brings us to C1, which is an update for uh, from staff and the Marine Services Facility Boatyard Ad Hoc Committee on the committee and the staff's recent activities. The chair of that committee uh, is Dana. So, Danny, you want to take it? Yes. Okay. The committee has not yet met this year, um, but I would like to say that the boat storage aspect of this uh, possible project, uh, the, the whole marine facility, services facility, uh, seems to be proceeding, and uh, there's about three boats over there, and it's kind of, there's not really been a advertising or anything of it, but boaters looking for storage have found this out on their own, and um, so I don't know if there's any formal thing out there yet, but it might be a... It will be going to city council. Along okay. with bundling with a few other of our revenue generating items, this, the boats out there are our, our pilot project, so to speak, to just kind of gauge um, interest and look at logistics and see whether it works for us as a management, as a management, or how much of a management issue it is. So far, it's been working pretty good. Yeah, it, uh, since I go down there every day, at, uh, recent, more recently, uh, it looks like it works out pretty good. I know a couple of the owners. Uh, the, the two sailboats uh, or, or the Santa Cruz 27 that's got the rig up and, and uh, that's one of the issues is the overhead wires but if you keep it on that side there's plenty of space so uh, other than that uh, there's a couple things I think we're going to talk about tonight um, later in uh, how to do with the working waterfront and some grant money some issues that we brought up before, and so I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Any questions for Dana? Lynn? Yes. Regarding the uh, boat storage yard and the three boats uh, that are there, have you set a fee schedule on it? How, how is it being built? The schedule we've used is within our existing master fee schedule that we use for our dry storage out in our yards. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's based on a parking space area. You know, say about 80 bucks a month. Lori's whispering to me, so. When we bring it to council, we'll, we'll recommend a formal fee schedule and we'll take a master fee schedule adjustment, but we'll do it along those lines. Thank you. Anybody else for Dana on that item? No? I didn't call for public comment. I should have done. I often forget to do that, which is a mistake on my part, but there, um, we don't have anybody from the public with us this evening, with the exception of those that are watching from home, and we don't have a way for you to phone in. 
so that brings us to C2, which is an update from the Finance and Budget Ad Hoc Committee. And the chair of that is Neil. Neil? Thank you. Uh, we were able to meet twice uh, since the last meeting. We met uh, right before Christmas uh, with the Harbor Director. And uh, then we had a separate meeting uh, after that with just the members of the Ad Hoc Committee. Um, I have a report here uh, for, I assume here for Eric to, if you want to go over a report, I think it might be at this time good for you to go over what you've put in here. And then after that, you might cross off a lot of the questions that I'm, I've got, and then uh, we can bring it back up here. Yeah, Neil, however you want to proceed, if you want to go through the, the spreadsheets or if you want to make your recommendations first, I don't know what's going to be most efficient. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I just assume we would uh, – let me just – I'll explain to the HAB what we did. Um, so we met at Eric's office, and we went over the schedules that you can see as attachments here, the, um, the capital requirements. And our recommendation was to put through uh, a priority listing, and we developed definitions based on um, importance, timing, and um, I'm not going to read off the definitions, but uh, we basically came up with a structure one through five, one being uh, most sensitive, most time sensitive. Uh, if you see an A next to anything, that just need, it needs an assessment. So it's a, an imp if it's a 1A, for example, it's important, but to know exactly how important it is, we need to have an assessment done. So going through the various, the various uh, capital schedules, we have capital equipment requirements, we have um, a maintenance requirement, and then we've got, what's the third here? We've got our uh, replacement requirements. So these were all applied to, this priority list was applied to all of them uh, in our meeting with Eric, and then he presented us with this document then the ad hoc committee met privately and went back over this to make sure that we felt that this was accurate. And um, as far as the accuracy goes, we're basing that, our judgments are based on the information that's been given to us from the harbor director. Uh, the only thing that could possibly increase the accuracy, we'd feel, would just be actual assessments on all these items that have an A next to them and any other assessments for items that, that don't necessarily have an A next to them, but um, eventually over time they will need an assessment as this goes out, we looked at a 10-year uh, chunk of time. So um, at this point, recommendations from the ad hoc committee were to accept this priority list. And um, I'm not sure if we had any other, Ron, is there anything that I'm missing as far as recommendations go? I mean, we were just looking for, for input from the HAB to see if you guys concurred, essentially, with what our findings were and uh, what we reached with, with Eric. There wasn't necessarily a formal recommendation, I think, that we were hoping to get after this. Um, this was more for input for, for Eric. Yeah. yeah. I think that one of the things that we discussed is um, some of the things that are not on this sheet. Um, that really would lend a more of a scarier situation to the people that look at it, i.e. City Council. And the things that we don't know about because they're not been assessed is actually bulkhead work, i.e. the Innitmoral Bay crumbling into the bay. Um, just, you know, you go down the, the whole list there and those things from what I understand, are probably city. Um, they 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 have to they have to they're responsible for it. So that's one of the things that I think what we're looking for is what do we have to replace or could replace, and how much money really is it going to be? And I spoke with Eric about this, and maybe this would be a good time then, Eric, for you to explain a little bit about what the responsibilities are of leaseholders versus the city when it comes to the revetment and seawalls. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll go through that item. And I think to, to follow on, you know, Neil, the, you, you, we talked about four or five things um, in our meeting the other day, and I think we should cover all those in the same fashion. Um, as far as the, the seawalls go and revetment, you know, there, there's, there's two sorts of things out there um, 
there's the revetment, which is the rock pile, you know, the, the waterfront all around that forms our, our improved waterfront that's the rocks. And under most of our lease sites from, from let's say, Coast Guard doesn't have the revetment, but from Tognazini's dockside south, you know, all the way down to um, Associated Pacific, in almost all cases, the leaseholder is responsible for that revetment and any sea walls. In other words, concrete, wood, stone, whatever walls are built up or bulkheads, whatever you want to call them. There's different terminology. The, the leaseholder is responsible for maintaining those. There's a couple of exceptions there that the city is responsible for underneath the lease sites. In between lease sites, say uh, between the galley and the Hofbrau, the street end areas, the revetment, I don't think there's any seawalls in there. I think it's all revetment. The city's responsible for that revetment. Um, and any, I'm trying to think if there's any other seawalls in town. I guess there's a little seawall down at the very end of the launch ramp where that little informal park is, down in the slips where Jeremiah's at. The very yep. end, there's a little seawall down there that we would be responsible for. So those, I think, are the things you're looking at. And I think it's a totally valid and a good idea to add those things on here as another section <clears throat> or other items the the they're not piers they're not slips docks and vehicles but they're big infrastructure revetment fortunately knock on wood doesn't need a lot of work and is pretty long lasting but there's times I mean it ought to be looked at here and there and then the seawalls that are peppered in that we do own um, you know another one being revetment probably the revetment that we do have that needs attention is is more um, not revetment per se, but um, the coastal barrier over on the on the ocean side of the rock. Um, as you know, as you as you move east along the rock parking lot along the surf where the rock is, it starts to deteriorate as you get to our sand ramp. And if you see a bad winter where we lose six, eight, ten feet of sand, that rock's all missing and getting undermined. And there's a point where that end of that boardwalk could get eroded out because it's not properly armored. So that's would be another one that I would add on. So yeah, those things I think should be added on, but that's sort of the rubric of how that all works. When you do that, because you said you're, you said you're willing to do that and it, and it falls to the Harbor Department to do it, uh, could that schedule list out the those city sites either by the lease site or street end or location? Yeah, I think I would do it that way. Um, I think I would and, and functionally, if I were to go in and, and conduct some sort of an inspection, whether formal, informal, or whatever, of the revetment, in other words, the rock, I'd probably do it all as a as a whole, except for maybe on the ocean side. Maybe that's a separate piece. Um, but yeah, the revetment, I think, would be as a whole. But when it comes to the lease sites that, are, that we are responsible for um, and the bulkheads that are peppered in here and there, for instance, at the end of the launch ramp slips, I think those would be called out as separate items. I'd identify them. But it, uh, okay. But as you've just pointed out, the revetment in, in at least two macro locations has different aging. The revetment that's on the rock parking lot ages in one way, and the revetment inside the harbor ages in a different way. Yeah. So it seems like there's an opportunity for at least two revetment. Yeah, well, I think I macro items. Yeah, I think I stated I would, I would look at the rock, ocean side rock revetment. I think there's a better word for it. It's really, it's not a seawall. It's a, well, I don't know what it is, but it's. I guess it's a revetment. I think of revetment as an inside the harbor forming harbor infrastructure, which it sort of is, but sort of is. But anyhow, yeah, I would call those out separately, because that would be its own separate project. Okay, thank you. And you, you, you're on a roll. You said there were, you were going to address. The discussion items with the committee, all at one time. Yeah. Do you want me to bring them up one by one, or? Yeah. Why don't you? List that I yeah. Why don't you? So the other item was was one of the other items was prioritize the list. We've got them prioritized, but I've got them in in a Makes categorical sense. order, to where you know the the priorities mix around, and the the committee's recommendation was put them in priority order, priority one, and I could, you know, do both. It's handy to have them, have all the vessels, vehicles, and other things in one place in one sense, but it's also would be very convenient to have them prioritized um, from a pure urgency sense, and I'll, I'll put that together. It could be a separate um, sheet. 
Yeah, marriage. and Ron, when we talked about that earlier today when we're doing agenda, I, I apologize. I said, yeah, I think I can do that. I was thinking the February meeting, not tonight. My respectful suggestion is that we don't change the line items under a macro category, but simply create within that schedule, create five, if that's what it takes, five different subcategories. So potentially, for instance, um, schedule of 10-year capital requirement, uh, capital equipment requirements, if would be potentially be in five subcategories over the total in that spreadsheet. It's so you would see. So on. A, so on. A, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. So on that sheet, which is the first one in the staff report, 10-year capital equipment requirements. Which and another comment is it does need to actually go up to 10 years because it only goes to five. Yeah. Um, you'd you'd leave the v the category vehicles replacement as a category, but then under that you would have the two item two number two items listed first, and then the three, then the four. You'd you'd prioritize them that way. Well, it, it, as you're saying it back to me, that's going to that's going to be a pretty giant report. So maybe the best thing to do is to start with what you and Neil are already talking about right now, which is to just push the sort button and uh, and let it sort by let it, let an entire an entire schedule sort by priority. Okay, and there's different ways, especially with Excel. There's a yeah. lot of ways you to highlight and sort. to sort it. Yeah, and to subtotal it. You could subtotal up the priority one items. You could subtotal up priority two. You could have all sorts of subtotals, as you know. I mean, Excel I think the spirit of it is just to put in a priority. So when you get into it, if you find a mode that works, if it's better to do the whole document as one, or if you could do it under the subcategories, it's nice for organization when we're talking about yeah. your vehicles, for example. We can just look at them all. So we'll mess with it. I think the general direction is yes. Let's do some some better prioritizing and categorizing of things, so it paints the picture a little better. I mean, our prioritizing and, and Excel spreadsheet um, creativity is only going to be limited by um, Lori's creativity. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, next item, if we go to the third sheet, which is the uh, it's the replacement schedule, the schedule of ten-year capital replacement requirements. There was a few questions that came up. Um, when we look at what's actually approved in the in the boxed items, there, you'll see a few different items. One is the harbor office that has $315,000. Then there's two items down for the Beach Street slips. And so there's a two-part here. One would be the status of the Beach Street slips and then also the status of the harbor office. And if you could just explain what those actual funds mean. Are these actual funds that are sitting in an account that we can tap into now? And... Uh, or if these are hypothetical. So on that page, the Harbor Office 315000 that is the potential Coast Guard funding that they will pay us to demolish our building, the value of our building, if we give them our spot to build the building they want to build with the $1.4 million they have. Interestingly, or coincidentally, um, the Coast Guard folks from up in Alameda and an attorney from over in D.C. Um, were here on... Monday or Tuesday. On Tuesday, um, to re-engage us about their project to try and get it going because they're they're motivated. They've they did a lot better job this time. <clears throat> excuse me of explaining what their spending in critique is in terms of how much they can pay for rent and value and all that. Where we didn't really have that before, which I think we made good progress in that sense. And they came with two or three other. Um, methodologies by which we could potentially move this project forward with us getting increased office and better space and them getting increased office and better space. I won't go into the details of them, but that 315 was what they identified as the value of our building if they were to take our spot and we could somehow fund ourselves to build a new office over next door at the restroom site and they take our spot. So that's what that is. So it's a um, condition. It's there, but it's not in my budget until that project moves forward in a form that would enable that to occur. Okay. The Beach Street slips, the two numbers, 340 and 225, those are both in the um, this year's approved budget, council approved budget. It, the project is, is I've got consultants, engineering and, and project management consultants on the books working on that actively now. They're um, scoping out construction uh, materials and, and companies and looking at um, you know, electrical and water and all the different um, issues that are trying to 
drill down and, and really defining what we're going to build. Then we're going to put it out to build. We'll put together an RFP package and what we're going to build, and that'll go out to bid, and we'll be moving along on that. Um, the as I've, I've told you previously, I think the the amount that I was led to believe was in our accumulation fund, which was I want to say six or seven hundred thousand dollars going into this budget year. Uh, that number changed mid year midstream last year under the previous finance director. He said it was lower than what was there. And I've got um, Jennifer Callaway, the administrative services director. She's just started looking into the paperwork that was presented to me back then to try and figure out exactly where my accumulation fund balance is because I'm not sure where it is, unfortunately. Um, as it was, if it's where the previous finance director thought it was going to be, those Beach Street slips are pretty much going to exhaust our accumulation fund. And there's not going to be anything barely left for anything else. So um, we'll get yet to see where that'll come out and, and what our actual balance will be. So, uh, but those that project is funded. Is there? Uh, if you go down the page, the 250,000 launch ramp boring floats. That is the launch ramp grant from Boating Waterways. that's in hand. Uh, I think I've reported to you that you know we've we've gone through some scope and scale issues with Boating Waterways that we're still trying to work out. I finally came to the conclusion, went to the city council a couple, three meetings ago for um, some funding to to hire a, a project management um, person to, to work with me and DBW to resolve the issues between us and DBW to not lose that grant and keep that moving forward. So we've got that. We're moving forward on that. And then the next one down, 1.130 million, that would be the follow-on um, grant from DBW to build the actual thing. Um, assuming we continue, oh, I'm sorry, that's a total. Never mind. Um, the, the rest of the grant for that, it's about 1.9 million dollars now for the total on ramp. 250 secured. Um, the rest will come, assuming we get to the proper design stage and move forward. So that 1.13 is the total on there. Now, is the is there a reluctancy, or I don't want to use the word fear, but when you talk about you know, you put the money, you spend the money at the Beach Street slips, and then the accumulation fund is zeroed out. Is there just a fear that there won't be anything for something that's more emergent? Or is it, because I mean, if the project needs to get done and the money's there, what, it, you know, if the accumulation fund goes down, that is that is happening, but you're also spending that money on something that's on a top priority. Oh, it's woefully needed. I, yeah. No doubt. I think it's probably, you know, it's got to be the highest one of, if not the highest priority item I've got on here. Um, I intend to continue moving forward with it. I'm, I'm hopeful that, and you know, and then this last budget year is is closed out. We've gone through auditing. We went through finance director changes. So we've, I still don't know where completely we ended last year. Last year's been audited, but like I said, Jennifer's fresh on board and she's um, hasn't. She's, she's taking care of a lot of other things that are more critical to take care of, and we haven't circled back to where we are last year. So um, last year's finals haven't figured into the total of, of where Craig left me, so I don't know where we are. And then um, this year and how we're doing, and so it all plays in. So um, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll – let's say that if I, if I built Beach Street tomorrow in the blink of an eye and, and spent um, $565,000 – and depleted the accumulation fund down to about nothing. I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic that last year in this, we've got a modest little excess of revenues over expenses and we'll build a little kitty back up, but it's not gonna be a lot. Is there a balance that you wanna maintain in that account? Oh, it'd be great, yeah, yeah. sure. It'd be wonderful to have what but, I mean, like a consider set emergency reserve, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, oh, the, while we're talking about this exact form, uh, just format-wise, looking at this, if you go to the, uh, sorry, the same the page I'm talking about is schedule of 10-year capital major maintenance requirements. The total spill on to the next page, and there's just a, one single line. But if if you look at this, 2017-18 has a total of 2.195 million dollars. Correct. 2018 goes to 290, so on. It gets out to 15,000 dollars in 2020. This, if I was just looking at this, I would. I mean, it, is, it assumes that, or I assume that this is money that we need to spend right now, $2.1 million, but that if we get over that hump in 2020, 
that there's pretty green pastures where all we need to spend is $15,000. Is that accurate, or do you think that there might be a better format for this that would show a more accurate picture over, say, a 10-year I think as plan. we discussed, I think as, as Ron and Lynn and I may be discussed a little today, but I think definitely a 10-year is will achieve a better picture. It, we, I named it 10-year. We were intending to go out to 10-year, but it, you know, the numbers are, for all these items are predicated on the life of that thing based on when I recalculate the numbers, the life of that thing, the estimate of what it's going to cost to do that thing, and amortize it over those numbers of years that are left. That's what's left. The, so if I extend it out to 10 years, those numbers in those columns aren't going to change, but it's, it will show more columns and it'll show more reality of what's happening. Okay. There we go. I believe that's all the points that we had on this at this point, unless there's something else wrong that you think I'm missing. This is just in regards to the, the, the capital. No, I understand. Couple sheets. So, questions or comments from the board for Neil or for the Harbor Director? Bill? I'm fine. Dana? No. Good job. Lynn? Yeah. Jeremiah? Yeah. Jean? Yeah, I think your estimate of 150 per square foot for docks is low. Yeah, I, I, can, I concur with that. On replacement? Yeah. What do you think it would be? 175. For the for the for the kind that are in Morro Bay. So, my closing comment um, to the city and to the public is fiscal 1718. We are in the third quarter of fiscal 17 and 18. And after a lot of work on the part, careful work on the part of the Harbor Department, uh, who has good information, good data, and good history on all of this, and bearing in mind that there's four assessment items on this schedule in order to refine the numbers, $2.2 million dollars is needed this year for capital maintenance that's not that's not new that's not replacement that's maintenance um, the harbor advisory board has been commenting for as long as i've been on it about how expensive it is to maintain much less replace uh, improvements and in infrastructure on the water and also as we've oftentimes said is one of the principal elements of the economic locomotive in Morro Bay. This situation has to be grappled with by city leaders. Has to be grappled with by city leaders. Okay, so um, that brings us to... Before you move on, can I just... Sure. Sorry. Sure. Uh, one last item that we did discuss uh, was the cost allocation study. And uh, now that we do have a new, um, what's the title? Administrative Services, Administrative Services Director. Yes, uh, Eric, I believe, has broached the conversation with her. And we are hopeful to schedule a meeting with the ad hoc committee at the uh, earliest convenient, uh, convenient time for that. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that back up, Neil. And I want to add on to that. Um, you know, we're one of our goals is a gut check of the cost allocation. You know, look at it, see if there's anything really big and ugly, weird sticking out. And one of the things that I identified a couple of years ago was that lighting item, where the city's overall bill for lighting everywhere from PG&E, all the street lights we get, was in the neighborhood of ninety thousand dollars, of which we were paying thirty thousand, which is a third. And there's no way in God's green earth we own a third of the lights on the entire city. So. Um, the previous administrative services director worked out um, a way to start accounting for that because the cost allocation was clearly not correct. Um, I would like to get that down, and I guess what I'm looking for is some heads nodding north and south. Where I'm going to go with it is um, I've got the entire list of all the lights within the city, and they're reasonably organized by address, but not necessarily, but I've assigned uh, one of my patrol officers 
we've we've made a map of the Tidelands Trust and he's gone around every single light pole with a number on it and found it on the list and then found it physically location, put an X, marked it, showed what it is. In a couple instances he's found places where lights apparently don't exist anymore that we might still be paying for. So we and there's a couple instances where a a light type such as a 40 foot pole with two arms with big sodium vapor lights, 1500 watt lights are hanging on it, or is what the PG&E list says, but it's really one of those metal poles with a little coach lamp on the top, so probably overpaying for those. So there's two parts of this. One, I need to resolve with PG&E what we actually have and make sure their records match what's really happening out there. And two, once we get it all straightened out and I get everything mapped, I know what's where physically on the ground, um, I'm going to find out each of those lights has a cost that we pay for it. pg and &E has a schedule for it. And we're going to add up the ones that are in the Thailand's Trust and see exactly what they are. And then I'm going to take that to administrative services and say, forget the $30,000. You can scratch that. It doesn't, it's not reality. Here's what the lighting should be. And, and that's my approach to deal with that item and that gut check part of the cost allocation. So um, if that sounds reasonable. <laughs> well, that's, that's well, that's well beyond a gut check. Um, that's a fact check. And the Harbor Advisory Board has uh, historically and repeatedly endorsed uh, a pursuit of accuracy, the IE and update of the cost allocation uh, program, the city's cost allocation program for all departments, not just the Harbor Department. It needs to be fact-based. It is. We don't believe currently that it is fact-based fact for no other reason aside from the issue you, the factual issue you've, you have raised that the city has um, essentially reorganized uh, any number of those departments over the last decade since the cost allocation was done. We're happy to continue to endorse the Harbor Department's drive and desire to have its portion of the cost, the city's cost allocation program made accurate. And if we, if you would like us to communicate that to the city council to whom we serve, we'd be happy to do that. But I, uh, I, we take we take our lead from you. Okay. Well, I think at this point, like I said, I'm I'm gonna on the lights. I mean, it, it started as a gut check, and in that the lighting hit me in the gut. So that's why we're looking at it. Um, and this is, I think, a way to resolve it, and we'll carry that up the hill. And and I I think I, taking the the collective. Hey, this is what the Harbor Advisory Board is recommending we do. I think for at this point is good enough, and we'll see where that takes us. Yep. And we had discussed possibly another item that was unrelated to lights that would just kind of paint a picture of across the board. There might be some discrepancies within the cost allocation. Um, you know, we discussed possibly legal, you know, legal billing or another item. You know, you have the ability to pick the items that you want to do the gut check on. Um, but that was just something else that had stood out before in, in previous discussions, just seeing if that was something that you'd still considered or if you thought that just leading with the going with the lights was... No, was I'm not going to go exclusive on lights. I think that's another one because that's one that, that the cost, you know, when we went from an in-house attorney model to a contract attorney model, the dollar amount that was stipulated in the cost allocation, that was for an in-house attorney and that was the number. And so finance basically took that number and took it out of the cost allocation and then went with this other plan to allocate out this the contract city attorney's cost and that too needs a, a gut check and, a, and to see how that's being charged because there's two elements to that there's the his base contract time for him being here and doing the job he does that costs x amount of dollars that's getting divvied up amongst the general fund and the enterprise fund and then there's the what I always call the power by the hour, the stuff that he bills that goes directly to whatever department he bills. So um, we need to, to get clarification on how that's billed out as well and what those numbers look like. So yeah, I have, I'm not just exclusive of lighting by any means. Okay, thank you. That's it from me. Okay, any further comments or questions from the board on this agenda item? Okay, moving on, that uh, brings us to the update from the Eelgrass Ad Hoc Committee. And the chair of that committee is Lynn. Lynn? And I have nothing to report as we have not had a meeting since uh, we discussed the anchor QEA, which uh, Eric uh, talked about in his news report. 
and I can expand on a little more. So just to remind everybody, I had a scope of work from Anchor to do some eelgrass consultancy. We brought it in front of the HAB. We got some comments. I went back to Anchor with that and had him revise his scope, um, which he did. Um, we were concerned that the, he, the consultant was going to spend too much time researching the research and, and just regurgitating that. And while we want to acknowledge that it's there and identify that it's there, um, we don't need to, to know what it is and have a, a exhaustive listing of it and what it all means. We know what it is and what it means. Um, but there'll be a small element of, of that, but it's really going to be more about looking at typical projects that may be impacted by eelgrass as a deliverable um, for this whole project. Coming back to the Harbor Advisory Board um, with the basics of the California policy and what they know and what they've learned of the Newport Beach eelgrass policy and the Humboldt Bay eelgrass comprehensive management plan and see what lessons learned can come out of those two projects or those two plans that would apply to us and bring that back to the HAB and see if any of it's useful and how we want to take it. And then based on their experience working in Newport Beach on the Newport's plan and everything they've taken from public input, uh, outline a framework or a critical path for a, for an eelgrass comprehensive management plan. They're certainly not going to start on the path of writing one. That's not the scope of work. But we want to see, hey, what's the critical path? Identify what the issues are. What can we get out of these two plans? And what's our critical path to get from point A to point B um, from a regulatory and, and policy making standpoint? So that's what they're being contracted with. Like I said, I've uh, work on the final touches of the contract, getting it through legal, and that they should be under contract here shortly, and we'll get moving on that. And speaking of critical path, based upon what Lynn, you, and Eric know today, when might their work product be in hand from that consultant? Stand by. <laughs> I don't know that I've got a timeline that far out yet. While you're looking, uh, on behalf, uh, Lori, on behalf of the Harbor Advisory Board, we'd like to thank you for your superlative support and efforts on our behalf in 2017. Would you like an award? <laughs> Something special. <laughs>
you know, within the the recreational boaters as far as like the yacht club when they're doing races and yeah, stuff. Don't to let them know because trash. that's right in the path of well, especially one of them. It's a turning mark. Yeah, I mean, one of them does have a little float on it, a little red float, and we were going up towards it, and it was like, oh, oh, okay, you got to stay away yeah. from it, because it kind of, there's the float, and then there's the structure. Yeah, so it's a white square PVC frame, maybe 36 by 36. We just don't want to tear them up. Yeah. No, we don't, nobody wants to tear them up. Don't pick them up thinking you're taking trash out of the bay. Okay, next agenda item. Uh, C4 update from the Marine Sanctuary Ad Hoc Committee. I'm the chair of that. There is no current activity relative to that committee. Any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none. C5. Can I ask something about that? Absolutely. Before we move on. Um, and this is just a question for the committee chair um, and all the work we've done on that in the past. We're gearing up to go to Washington, D.C. again. Um, to go visit the Corps and our legislators and regulators and all the above, NOAA Fisheries and others. Um, would you have any opinion on knowing the state of where the, the existing Chumash Sanctuary proposal is and current administration and all things DC, is there any value, do you see any need to go seek any kind of information out of Washington, DC? Think not from Washington, DC, but from uh, from the regional director. Uh, he did respond to me last time and told me nothing's happening. Uh, that's Thank you for that. I will reach out to the regional director and okay. provide you with that information and the board with that information. Okay. Just thought I'd ask. Thanks. Appreciate it. So C5, update from the Working Waterfront Ad Hoc Committee. The chair of that committee is Gene, and it looks to me like, Gene, you, we might want to bifurcate um, the report into two separate elements. One is the committee's recent activities, and the second would be the issue of support for H.R. 1176. I agree. We uh, just had a meeting this evening um, over at the community center, and we discussed um, trying to define Measure D in a little more clarity. Um, we came up with three three words that we were unclear, or three verbiages in the Measure D thing. One was the primary use, and a second one was the non-commercial recreational fishing um, statement, and then the third one I can't remember what that one. Incidental. Incidental. Incidental there too. Right. Um, and we we more or less redefined those words there, and I think that'll come up um, when um, we come back with a definition, a clear definition. Unless uh, Ron wants to comment on that, I think we'll come. But we made progress on that, and we feel real happy with that. We had um, Scott from Planning, Eric from the Harbor Department, myself and Ron, and Jerry Luer from Planning, with a number of um, public public comment on that. Uh, and then we also talked in uh, on the working waterfront. Um, we were in agreement with the planning commission that we want to define working waterfront as the three separate areas from Target Rock to Beach Street, Beach Street down to probably the fish cleaning station or Tidelands Dock. And then from the third area would be the, the southern section from the Tidelands Dock. Um, Blanche Hop area down to State Park Marina. Um, so we made some progress in that. Um, we feel as though we will work, come up with a, uh, we've come up with a mission statement that we're going to collaborate between the two that we've already come up for um, and combine those. And then Eric and I believe Scott will more or less put that together and come back to the Harbor Board for us and Planning Commission for them, for them to review. Um, and, um, and then it will go for the, the, the general local coastal plan, and then we would like to include from that some policy statement um, beyond the mission statement, and maybe we'll have some bullet points on the policy, how we interact or implement the, the working waterfront. And that's basically what we came up with in our meeting. Yeah, I guess from a process standpoint, you know, it, the working waterfront part of it, um, and Measure D, but really working waterfront 
mission statement, some basic policy things we want to achieve goes into the general plan, local coastal plan, and then in the waterfront master plan, it gets more down into the meat and bones of the things we want to accomplish to implement the mission statement. And we actually talked about renaming the waterfront master plan the working waterfront master plan. So um, as Gene said, we'll potential we'll do one more subcommittee meeting of the joint group. We'll see how it turns out and how, how the work product comes out of this. Um, but at any rate, whether or not we have one of those, we'll, we'll coalesce everything back together, bring it to a joint HAB PC meeting of total of both bodies hash out the stuff and all the recommendations and hopefully be able to make a recommendation forward to the general plan advisory committee and then for all intents and purposes we're done i mean we still comment on those documents as they come forward but we'll we'll get what we what we need on measure d and working waterfront get it to the general plan advisory committee and they'll um, put it into those uh, three documents as those documents move forward the waterfront master plan is a further on item it, you know the gplcp will happen sooner and then the implementing documents, which is the waterfront master plan, the downtown strategic plan, and the this plan, that plan, those come later. So we'll probably be more involved with those later as they move on, but we'll have the, the basic skeleton of stuff that will go into those. So I felt like we made some good progress today. And then, um, and then looking at it in our staff report here, there is a um, bill in front of the Congress. Let, let's see. If if there's any questions about that oh, sure. about that portion any, any questions, questions from the board about that portion of the committee's report comments okay uh, the only thing I would add is that the uh, this working joint committee today uh, based upon the input from mr. Lohr conceptually identified the three sectors as from Target Rock to Beach Street is actually Measure D, so it's self-defined. Uh, from Beach Street down to Tidelands, uh, waterfront, working waterfront-related activities, and then south uh, from Tidelands uh, down to the State Park Marina, uh, nature. And waterfront activities. Nature, yes, nature-related water. Yes, yes. What and public access said. as well. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. But they largely agreed with our mission statement, mm -hmm. planning commission, and the subcommittee members. The mission statement, the documents we had done, and, and the zoning. You know, the different idea of the three different zones. They, they were largely in concurrence, and Jerry had some good input to, for us to, to add into the mix. So, I, like I said, I think it was a pretty productive meeting. Okay, well, you just described the third area as nature, but also working water activities. So if there's activities going on there now, I mean, you have a marina, you have a, uh, some, there's sort of a boat yard there, um, and things like that, but you also have open space for tourism and stuff like that, but it, is there... As far as working waterfront activities, that's every that's in all sections. That's correct. And so you can expand on those if it's allowable through zoning or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so those three categories were were just general statements of the three different areas. Okay. In, in in each one of those three areas, there we know that there is activity that's working waterfront, and potentially it might be. So, yes. And then, and, um, Eric, if you want to follow up on the staff report for um, HR 1176, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so thanks, Gene. So um, I think, Dana, you might have been the one, that, first one that brought this to our attention here several meetings ago. You know, a bill was introduced to this Congress, Congress, the 115th Congress, HR 1176. It was introduced by Congresswoman Pinnegree of Maine. Um, where they're working waterfront, um, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, Ron, I think theirs is more commercial fishing oriented, where Florida seems to be a tourism and hotel related thing. Um, more commercial fishing oriented, um, recognizing that um, water dependent communities and coastal activities are slowly, and this is a lot of the talk we had today in our meeting, you know, it's getting pushed out by economic development in the and the forces of economic pressure that that squeeze out 
you know, commercial fishing and other commercial type uses. And and um, Congressman Pendergy recognized that and and put together this bill to direct NOAA to both um, first identify um, working waterfronts and coastal uses and infrastructure that's in, in uh, under duress or in, in need of, of help and a funding mechanism via, via grant program to states, which the states can pass on as sub-grantees to other entities, but it goes to states um, for purposes of both infrastructure, um, repair and installation and land acquisition. In other words, if, if some property goes up for sale that, you know, it's it's on the market and it's on a, a fair market value for for something that's expensive because it's waterfront property and somebody coming in to do a, maybe a commercial fishing and loading activity isn't going to have that kind of chops to buy something like that. There's a grant program that could buy that property to go put it into that kind of use and take it out of the non-working waterfront use. So this bill is working its way through Congress. It's only gone to a couple of hearings. Um, interestingly enough, I was watching a, a hearing on from the, the House Subcommittee on Energy, Power, and Oceans and noticed a familiar face of the young kid sitting next to the, to the Congress people there and started rifling through my cards from my CMAC meeting in D.C. last week and went, aha, that's Richie McConnell. He's the kid that I talked to about fisheries. And so I shot him off an email. So it just goes to illustrate the value of the whole CMANC thing, going back to D.C. And, and how you can build these relationships. So um, I put in front of our city council on Tuesday to support this bill, the resolution, which they did unanimously. I think, although it's probably a long shot that we'll ever get grant money out of this, there's a potential. And it would be money for things like boat yards. Um, it, like I said, it, it's through the state, and it's a fairly convoluted process, but if it, it can potentially result in grant opportunities, um, I think we should support it. And kind of like my story about the, the young staffer, uh, you know, build a relationship with, with Congresswoman Pinnigree and, and some of the other sponsors of this bill, say, see if maybe Congressman Carberhall wants to jump on board. But that's how, you know, Washington, D.C. works when you build relationships and... and, and um, we can maybe get some of the things enacted, both you know, working waterfront, fishery, other things. So uh, I think it's worth the effort, um, and the council agreed and voted for it. And I'm just asking the Harbor Advisory Board to sort of back that up, and and um, agree with that as well, and, and and see if we can support that. Um, we can certainly do a letter um, from the Harbor Advisory Board chair to go along with our uh, resolution when I go march back to D.C. because I will go visit her office and and uh, plunk it on their desk and, and see what happens. So. Gene, with your indulgence before we get into a board discussion of this, um, I, I'd like to, uh, the public probably hasn't seen a copy of 1176, so I'd like to just touch on a couple of highlights. Uh, and I'm reading out of the bill, <clears throat> purpose. Purpose of this section is to preserve and protect coastal access for persons engaged in water-dependent commercial activities, including commercial fishing, recreational fishing, businesses, aquaculture, boat building, or other water-dependent coastal-related business. Uh, the, if the bill is passed, the working, and, and if it passes as written, the Working Waterfront Task Force would its establishment and function. The Secretary of the Interior shall establish a task force to identify and address critical needs with respect to working waterfronts. Uh, in terms of functions, the task force shall identify and prioritize critical needs with respect to working waterfronts in states that have a management program approved by the Secretary of Commerce pursuant to six, Section 306. Do we know whether the state of California has such a program? I do not definitively know. Initially, when I really started digging into this, I thought not, but I've since uncovered a few other things that leads me to believe we do, but I don't definitively know the answer to that. But yeah, that's one of the, when I brought up, yeah, it could be a long shot that we ever get this. It, it's going to require the state because as written, and maybe that's one of the things we can, you know, potentially when we go back to D.C., the lobby for is, is rather than have this be strictly to states, can it be to a community that has the same plan? Because I think we could arguably say, you know, both 
with general plan local coastal plan update could help but we've got our fishing community sustainability plan uh, whether that meets the criteria that they're going to set forth i don't know but i think it'd be a heck of a lot better if we could do it on a on a local basis rather than have to go through the state for it which is a whole nother layer I, mean, a federal, I totally agree with that federal and, grants difficult enough and i had the impression when i read that that the draft the drafters of the bill were unaware that there are only two states so far that have a a, uh, a a working waterfront program established by law but there are a number at least a dozen local authorities that do as well so that's to my mind is a shortcoming i agree with you that's a shortcoming of this bill um, but anyway um, it's a bill it can be changed and i think when yeah yeah i think it's a draft like i said i'd like to go back to dc with with um, that resolution and visit um, congressman pingree but also um, i think a letter from harbor advisory board maybe we can lay out some of that stuff and lobby a little bit for some of those changes so the only other thing i'd like to read for the public's benefit is uh, uh, as you mentioned uh, in your staff report eric that that embedded in this bill is a working waterfront grant program and the wording the introductory wording says the secretary shall establish a working waterfront grant program in cooperation with appropriate state regional and other units of government that seems to be in conflict with the prior section but okay under which the secretary may make a grant to any coastal state for the purpose of implementing a working waterfront plan approved by the secretary under subsection d subject to the availability of appropriations the secretary shall award matching grants under the program to coastal states with approved working waterfront plans through a regionally equitable competitive funding process so that's some highlights out of 1176. Jean? eric i had a question in california how many harbor state or how many, or how many districts do you know of that are pursuing working waterfront status. Do you have any idea? No, I don't. And whereabouts are we? Um, well, if, if you don't know, then we don't know whether we're the first or the only. I don't know. Okay. And if, and if add on to Ron's reading of some of the bill's key statements is in that same section, coastal states may allocate grants to local governments, agencies, or non-government organizations eligible for assistance under this section. So that's where the possibility of a local like us getting it but it appears as it is it still has to go through the state which managing a grant that is both state and local could be quite interesting <laughs> okay comments questions from the board bill dana yeah i just wanted to say one thing about um endorsing this and recommending uh would there be a, would it be helpful if we had um, like say the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization organization and the National Estuary Program here um, doing the same thing or yeah. adding on to this or something? Yeah, you know, it sounds silly, but I've walked the halls in D.C. and you see Cub Scout groups going and meeting with senators and. That stuff makes a difference. You yeah. get your voice heard and you get your concerns there to their office. That stuff makes a difference. So, yeah, I, absolutely. If the fishermen's already wanted to jump on board with that, I mean, I said, I think it's going to be a long shot and maybe the bill can be amended, but it's, it, to me, it's worth supporting. Yeah. Could private business as well, such as an aquaculture? company more yeah. oyster company but further than that i'm part of the pacific coast shellfish growers association that's every grower from basically san diego to alaska and they and, and maybe i'll ask you if i i have yet to reach out to a lot of other organizations to see where they might stand on this um, some of the bigger commercial fishing groups or organizations may have a position on this bill already i i could not find usually at least with state legislation you typically see who's on record in uh, in support or opposition sometimes you'll get the actual documents that they sent in in support or opposition but usually they almost always list who's in support or opposition 
either the federal system doesn't do that and or I haven't been able to find it or the bill just hasn't gone along far enough for anybody to really weigh in. It's just gone to a couple of hearings and none of the hearings have been decisionary making at all. They've just been taking testimony. So it may not be far enough along to, to garner that. But there could be some of the bigger organizations like that that may have already weighed in on it. I don't know. Well, I can find out. And you can if, find out. If they great. haven't, when are you guys leaving for CMIC? When would you, to take, you know, we can send a letter of support. You can also take it a is copy March with you. It is March 5 through 7 is when we're back in D.C., first week in March. Okay. Jeremiah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization has already sent uh, support as far as letters go to this working waterfront bill. And also, this was started many years ago. This was started by Olympia Snow, I believe, probably five or six years ago. And, the, and uh, Congress Lady Pingree is, <coughs> Olympia retired. Congress Lady Pingree is going forward with it wonderfully. Uh, they didn't receive a whole lot of funding, but it's a first step. It's still alive. And I think uh, everybody should support it, every port. And there's a lot of movement in Washington and Oregon and Alaska <clears throat> to uh, to adopt this working waterfront bill. So there, there is uh, a lot of support for it as far as the ports uh, in the industry go currently. So. Good. Gene? Uh, I'm wondering, what would be the downside of this? Can you think of anything that would, that would be downside? Maybe federal involvement in our local policies? Or? Whenever you get the federal government involved, it gets pretty burdensome. <laughs> Funny you ask, um, or interesting you ask. In, in watching that hearing, I didn't watch the whole thing. It was several hours long. But um, the, the governor of Maine, I don't recall his name at the moment, but the governor of Maine was critical of, it, of this bill, primarily because it was his opinion there were already grant programs under a couple other um, federal grant programs that are available to for working waterfront type uses that already have X number of millions of dollars allocated to them. And, he, and his thought was, the downside of it was, now you, you're throwing NOAA into a, a grant letting and evaluating process when NOAA can't agree with, with Department of Transportation, which can't agree with the sanctuaries program, and none of these federal agencies can agree with each other, and it's just going to add another conflicting grant program competing for money with another grant program that are trying to do the same thing, but the but the departments can't talk to each other because they don't agree, and that was his criticism of it: was leave it as it is. The money's already there, and being administered by other departments or agencies, don't throw no into doing a whole other layer. That was his. Yeah, I watched. I watched that hearing, and uh, there was a bit of partisanship also mm -hmm. going on. No. Uh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> there. Uh, but also, um, I, I got the feeling that there's a lot more programs on the East Coast, just because there's so many more ports and harbors than there is on the West Coast. However, on that commission um, was a the senator from uh, in Northern California. It was all for it. Um, I can't remember his name right off offhand, but uh, Thompson from uh, Mendocino. Uh, uh, I think it's Marin Mendocino and. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. And uh, he was all for it. You know, which you know, there's not a huge amount up there, but it would be great. To see some West Coast activity as far as uh, support going for this, just you know, everything. I think that. Yeah. And we'll be asking. I mean, I'll be, we, when we go to DC, I'll be bringing to Senator or Congressman Carver Hall and asking for his support. I mean, you'd be going to Greg Haas local first and work it through the chain, but we're ask him to get on board as well so well the, the the bill doesn't appear to identify in terms of a its proposed working waterfronts grants program the entities that would be involved in approval 
It identifies entities that would be involved in a task force to identify and address critical needs with respect to working waterfronts. And the bill identifies those entities as experts in the unique economic, social, cultural, ecological, geographic, and resource concerns of working waterfronts and representatives from NOAA representatives from the United States Fish and Wildlife, representatives from the Department of Agriculture, representatives from the Environmental Protection Agency, representatives from the United States Geological Survey, the Navy, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and such other federal agencies as the Secretary considers appropriate. Yeah, well, but that's the task force. So first first the first thing that first thing that goes through my mind is that's how camels got invented but um, uh, but anyway if there's nothing in the bill I don't read anything in the bill as to who what the approving entities would be for this proposed grants program so well that's interesting because they it seemed like the conversation was talking about NOAA as you said and we've looked at NOAA grants more recently and they seem to give out more research type grants and this is more uh, this would be physical infrastructure Could be. specific but no is in the Department of Commerce yeah but so it's interesting that yeah you're right Noah seems to be always more scientific -y than right than right but it seemed like that's in the discussion that I, I, I remember hearing it seemed like they were talking about Noah uh, when they were presenting the bill but it, you bring up a good point because it's not specific here okay uh, just just as a footnote of course until it goes through finance and they see how much they allocate because when Olympia came out with the first working waterfront type bill years ago they they financed it for three million dollars so it you know I mean to be spread around the entire United States of America I don't know what we did with our 50 cents. But. <laughs> okay, so to move this along, um, uh, unless someone else has a motion, I'll propose a motion. This is a, as, as a discussion item. Uh, would, we would only discuss it if it had a second, which I'm, I'm proposing that we do this just to move a process. Uh, does anyone have a motion? No? So I move that the Morro Bay Harbor Advisory Board endorse HR 1176 and uh, encourages modifications to the bill as necessary to ensure that local government authorities be written in as potential direct recipients of the bill's proposed working waterfronts grant program. I'll second it. Okay, so uh, discussion on this particular, on, on what, on, sure, you, you bet. Uh, what was moved and seconded was the Morro Bay Harbor Advisory Board endorses H.R. 1176 and encourages modifications to the bill as necessary to ensure that local government authorities be written in as potential direct recipients of the bill's proposed Working Waterfronts Grant Program. So the, fir the first question for the board to consider is, do we want to do something relative to 1176? And if we do, what is it we want to do? And I couldn't, we can't have the discussion without a motion. So that's what we're, that's why I took this approach. Well, I like, I like the idea. I'm just wondering if that uh, is what they're, I mean, if that's going to get us well, I guess it wouldn't matter. Never mind. Well, well, bear in mind that in the staff report, Eric reported that the city council has already endorsed 1176. And was that, was, was that without condition? They just said we endorsed 1176? Hey, correct. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't condition it. I'll, I'm going to pull up the resolution just to see exactly what I put in there. But. Well, we, this motion supposes that that we would uh, publish, that the Harbor Advisory Board would publish 
a recommendation, and the recommendation would essentially be described by whatever motion we choose to approve. Neil? I would support that motion without the condition. I think the condition is also important because I do the spirit of that that condition I think is vital, you know, especially in California for us to actually have a chance at getting access to those funds. Uh, it'll be a lot harder to wade through if we have to go through the state. I'm not saying it's impossible, but as I read it, I, I, it was hard for me not to be a little bit pessimistic about what tape would have to go through to get to us. So, um, but I would, I would, I support it as it is written, or as you said it. Bill, I concur, and I think that uh, the Harvard director and uh, the chair of our board should construct the letter and and i think you've heard our comments and um if there's any changes so be it and present it in the hallways of washington dc yeah yeah I, I think it's it's a go oh, motion okay lynn Under whom? I I think that if in, if a majority of the Harbor Morro Bay Harbor Advisory Board has the concerns that at least two of the members have about money getting through the state, um, that it's appropriate for us to a endorse the bill if that's what the majority of the board wants to do, and b to say we'd really like to be able to get the money directly, a local authority should get the money directly, be able to be able to access the grant program directly. Yeah, that's and that's pretty standard in in an entity going and supporting a bill saying, Hey, I like your bill, I support it, but here's the suggestions to make it better. Yeah, that's standard all the time. Yeah, that didn't hinder us at all, I don't think. When when the Army Corps of Engineers funds the, the dredging or, or the dredging funds, that's federal. Um, do you negotiate with the federal government for any of that, or is that just something separate? Corps Engineers funding, I work with um, District LA, um, and the, between their staff and, and, you know, where our needs are, and let's say for the, for the whole channel dredging, because the Aquinas is pretty baked, although knock on wood it's not a sure thing but it's pretty baked into their system now but the whole channel dredging you know every five to seven years it is basically on the basis of when we're starting to see problems we you know we, we keep Corps of Engineers in the loop and they they basically figure out by way of roughly what kind of volume they think there is and what the costs are they'll come up with a recommendation they'll say okay we we think 7.5 million ought to be the number that you shoot for, and then we recommend that through CMANC to Congress and to the core, and then core takes that and says, "See, this is what the city of Morbay wants," and we work together, and that's how that process works. So, so yeah, we work uh, together with them. So I you guess. do work with the federal government? Yes. Yeah. So I don't I guess see any the problem with this. Short yes. story long, yes, we do. I'm in favor. Of it. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? carries and uh, Bill take your comment to heart and I'll uh, work with the Harbor director to put something together that uh, that he thinks would be the most useful bearing in mind the the uh, board's motion okay that brings us to a declaration of future agenda items uh, do we have any a, a new and or additional or modified agenda items that anyone would like to declare Neil uh, the item that was discussed earlier regarding the um, the boat, uh, the museum, regarding the uh, the lighting, the electricity, the option for uh, sure. dis discussing that. Sure, I don't know how, sure. How you no, no, that. no, that, that's fine. Yeah. We talked about him bringing back yeah. some information to yeah. us, and I figured if we put it on the agenda, then we could actually okay. get it on next month. Okay. So, um, Laurie, if you please, uh, uh, Maritime, Morro Bay Maritime Museum uh, lighting. Uh, power, power. Sorry, overhead power, power line undergrounding. There. Well, nice. You've done this before. Anybody else? 
I'm going to declare an agenda item. Okay, and before we adjourn, I want to remind the board that uh, the next meeting in February is the first regular meeting of 2018, and according to the bylaws, that is when we appoint chairs and vice chairs. So that will be there. I won't be here next week, and Lynn will be, or sorry, next meeting, Lynn will be chairing, which is, I'm sure. We'll, no, no, no. Well, whatever you know. Anybody that's interested in those positions should, you know, make sure they get nominated. Uh, the, 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 they're wide open. No, well, that's not anybody that's interested. You know, really. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.